This video is presented by the EA Creator Network. Big thank you to EA for allowing me to capture this early access work in progress footage. In this road to glory, my name is Cooper Thompson, a five-star wide receiver recruit who just arrived at Florida State University. In high school, I was a legend at football powerhouse Duncanville, and even though I'm only five foot nine, I've got hands like glue, and I've never missed a day in the weight room. Scouts have said that the sky is the limit for me, and if I can translate my high school success to the college game, I could be the best Florida State receiver since Peter Warwick. But there was hardly time to think about that, because before I knew it, I found myself in Ireland for our opening game of the season as we played on ESPN in the Aer Lingus Football Classic against the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. I came out amped up and ready to go, but on the very first play, I completely whiffed on my block attempt and realized I needed to dial it back just a little bit. After settling in and gaining my composure, on third down, I ran the first route of my college career, a simple curl route, and I secured the catch for the first down. It was clear that our game plan was to pound the rock on the ground as much much as possible with star running back Roy Dell Williams, who had just transferred from Alabama and was one of the most talented running backs in the country. On our first drive of the second half, we found ourselves down 20 to 14, but on the second and two play, I was able to get inside leverage on the defensive back and hauled in the 20 yard catch to show everyone that I'm not afraid to go over the middle. Jumping ahead to the start of the fourth quarter, we had a five point lead and were looking for an insurance touchdown. That's when on the second and five play, we ran a jet sweep in my direction, and I may have gotten away with a block in the back, but it cleared out enough space for receiver Jaki Douglas to take it all the way to the end zone for the touchdown. On the next drive, the Georgia Tech cornerback was talking a ton of trash about my block in the back and said I couldn't block him without taking cheap shots. Well, that got me fired up, and on this first and 10 run play, I put him on his back and then pancaked the safety as well, and that gave Roydell Williams all the space in the world to sprint down the sidelines and take it all the way for the game ceiling 59 yard touchdown. Even though I finished the day with just two catches for 25 yards, my teammates and coaches all recognized that I was willing to lay it all on the line to help our team win football games. In week two, we were at home in Tallahassee to take on the Boston College Eagles. The FSU stadium was absolutely electric before the game. Hearing the entire crowd singing the war chant while doing the tomahawk chop in unison sent chills down my spine and boy was I grateful that I played for the good guys. Coach tried to get me involved early by calling a screen for me on the first play of the game, but nobody ended up blocking and I lost a yard on the play. After our offense drove past midfield with ease, running back Lawrence Toa Philly put the ball on the ground and Boston College jumped on it and all of a sudden you could tell that the crowd was starting to get a little bit nervous. On the next drive, Coach once again dialed up a screen pass for me and this time it worked to perfection and I sprinted up the field for a 13 yard gain. On the very next play, play though, I made the first big mistake of my college career. For whatever reason, after a solid run by Lawrence Toa Philly, I came in late and shoved the DB in the back even though the play was essentially over. I was flagged for an illegal block in the back, which wiped out all the yards that we had just gained. I had to stay focused though and put it behind me because in the third quarter, we found ourselves down 16-7 to and in desperate need of some offense. That's when on first and 10, coach dialed up an absolutely beautiful play where I just had to run my post to draw the DB inside, and that allowed running back Roy Dell Williams to get left completely unguarded down the sideline, and he took it to the end zone for the 30-yard touchdown. Jumping ahead to a little over two minutes left in the fourth quarter, we had a one-point lead, but the game was far from over since if Boston College held us out of the end zone, they would get a chance for a game-winning drive with about a minute left. After we couldn't punch the ball in on the ground, on third and goal, my job was to find a soft spot over the middle. Boston College completely sold out for the run and DJ Ui Ungalale put it right in my chest and I hung on for my first receiving touchdown of my college career. Boston College did end up scoring a touchdown but couldn't convert the two-point conversion and we escaped our home opener with a 24-22 victory. My touchdown catch at the end of the game had put me on the map and that week people were blowing up my phone left and right. I got my very first NIL offer from Chef Sporting Goods who said I would gain 500 
social media followers every week if I just came to do a meet and greet and sign some autographs. Then our offensive coordinator reached out about getting in some extra practice reps this week, and I happily said yes to working on routes over the middle. And not too long after that, I was asked by my friend Delaney to go to an off-campus party, and not wanting to miss out, I decided to skip my lab and go have some fun. But unfortunately, a few days later, my academic advisor informed me that I had missed a pop quiz in the lab that I had skipped, and I needed to start taking school seriously if I was going to stay academically eligible. After some easy wins against Memphis and Cal, we went on the road to Dallas to take on the SMU Mustangs. On our first drive, the extra work I had put in with the offensive coordinator paid off, and on this third and eight play, I found an opening over the middle and hauled in the catch for a 14-yard gain. Two plays later, we found ourselves facing another third down, and this time I showed off my fundamentals when I broke outside, kept my feet inbounds, and hauled in the catch to convert another first down. I didn't have any more catches in the first half, but our offense was still rolling, and we went into halftime with a 21-13 lead. On our first drive of the second half, Roydell Williams decided to go off. He took this handoff up the middle and exploded for another highlight reel touchdown run to make the score 31-13 and left SMU fans absolutely stunned at what they were watching. Later in the third quarter, we had the ball again, and at this point, we were just trying to run up the score. First and goal, I found space in the back of the end zone and got absolutely destroyed, but somehow hung onto the ball. I initially thought the flag was for the hit that I just endured, but it turned out to be an illegal man downfield penalty, which took my touchdown off the board. After sitting out for a couple drives, in the fourth quarter, I was playing angry, and on second and 12, I pancaked the DB to let him know I wasn't messing around. But then on the very next play, he returned the favor and put me on my back, so I decided that maybe I shouldn't mess with him for the rest of the game. We held on for the 34-27 victory, and after only catching three balls for 23 yards, I hoped that soon I would have a bigger role in our offense. After that game, I got my second NIL offer from Oscar's Pizza, and of course I said yes to that, because who doesn't love free pizza? I also spent extra time studying that week, and two weeks out from my big exam, I was already feeling prepared. With that peace of mind, I was able to fully lock in for our primetime game on ESPN as we hosted the Clemson Tigers. Apparently, the Tigers watched our tape from earlier in the year and told the refs to look out for me blocking in the back, because on our first drive, I got flagged again on this run by Lawrence Toa Philly, although honestly, I think the Clemson player flopped. But that wasn't going to slow me down, and later in the drive, I made maybe the greatest block of the entire season when I came down and slammed into three Clemson defenders at the same time to spring Lawrence Toa Philly free for the 31-yard touchdown. The refs weren't done with their BS, though, because on the very next drive, I was just trying to run my route, and the Clemson defender purposely got in front of me to flop, and I got called for another illegal block in the back penalty. Now I was really pissed, and on the very next play, I pancaked the Clemson player as hard as I possibly could, and I made sure to jog by the ref and ask him if I got him in the back on that one too. As fun as all this blocking was, I did want to catch the ball at some point too, and fortunately, early in the third quarter, on this third and 11 play, DJ Ui Ungalale was able to find me in space over the middle, and I hauled in the catch for a 19-yard pickup. That drive resulted in us kicking a field goal, and late in the fourth quarter, we had a 31-21 lead, and we're just running the clock out. I made sure to pancake the Clemson DB one more time for him to remember me by, and the first down from Roydell Williams officially ended the game. With all the nonsense they tried to pull that game, I was beyond happy that we were able to send the Tigers packing with an L and a long bus ride home. My popularity on campus was growing like crazy, and during the week, I was invited by my classmate Audrey to go out to a late night party. I was beyond excited that I was getting invited to legit college parties, but I didn't want to seem overly eager, so I made sure to play it cool. We were undefeated and ranked number three in the country as we traveled to South Florida to take on the struggling Miami Hurricanes. Despite their poor record, they had us completely bottled up in the first quarter, and it seemed like half our plays were going for negative yards. In the second quarter, we found ourselves down 10 when coach finally got me involved with this mid-screen that I was able to take for 13 yards to hopefully get us some momentum. That play sparked a huge turnaround for us, because after a quick touchdown and a Miami turnover, with just 9 seconds left, we found ourselves trying to score from the 10-yard line, and Malik Benson was able to haul in the out route just past the goal line to bring us within 3 points heading into halftime. With us down by 7 in the 4th quarter, it was clear that the Miami 
Miami defenders didn't take me seriously as a receiver. So on this first and 10 play, when they decided to not guard me at all, I was able to haul in the easy catch and take it for 18 yards. Unfortunately though, DJ Uwe Ungalale was struggling to communicate with us because of the stadium noise and we never got in the end zone again. Ultimately, we fell to the Hurricanes by a score of 34 to 24 and it was a stunning loss for us after it seemed like we had been unstoppable. To make a bad week even worse, I got a text message from coach saying that he had been sent a picture of me partying past curfew. I was disappointed with myself and I knew that it would take time to win back the trust of both my coaches and my teammates. Despite my lack of responsibility, coach stayed true to his promise that I would be given the chance to compete with Malik Benson for the number one receiver spot on the depth chart. And after I only had three receptions in our blowout win against North Carolina, I knew that this position battle was my only chance to prove that I could be our team's number one receiver. The position battle consisted of three drills, and whoever could win two of the three drills would be our team's wide receiver one for the rest of the season. The first drill was rack attack, where I showed off my ability to take the ball on the run and make defenders miss on my way to the end zone. It turned out that I was way better at this than the coaches had expected, and I scored on nearly every rep, helping me easily win the first drill. The second drill was wide receiver skeleton, where we had to get open before the sack timer ran out, and I dominated this drill as well. Not only did I show off my stellar hands and ability to hold onto the ball through contact, but I also proved that I could consistently find open space and had a great sense of where the defenders were at all times. The final drill was the wide receiver route tree, and while DJ Uwe Ungulale struggled for a lot of the drill to throw the ball with proper timing, he eventually figured it out for the final few reps. I finished the position battle having won all three drills, and now I was solidified as the number one receiver for the Florida State Seminoles. In the following week, we faced our biggest test of the regular season as we traveled to South Bend, Indiana to take on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, who were somehow ranked number five in the country despite having a record of six and two. After a slow start, we found ourselves in an early 14 to zero hole and we desperately needed an offensive spark. Coach decided that we needed to get back to basics and start attacking underneath. So on back to back plays, all I had to do was run a simple curl route and DJ Uwe Ungulale hit me both times for easy yards. That forced the defense to play more aggressively and a few plays later, their aggressiveness was punished when wide receiver Destin Hill caught this fade route for the 28 yard touchdown to make the score 14 to seven. Late in the first half, it was now a three point game and coach called for me to run a deep corner route and it would have been wide open, but DJ Uwe Ungulale threw the ball way too soon before my route could develop and it resulted in an ugly interception. At halftime, coach told me he wanted to get me the ball more, so on third and four on our first drive of the second half, he dialed up a jet touch pass for me and even though it was clear to everyone that I picked up the first down, the refs apparently forgot their glasses and spotted me short of the line. Despite the unfortunate outcome of that play, coach really liked what he saw on the jet touch pass and at the start of the fourth quarter, we went back to it. This time I took the ball, turned the corner, blew past one defender, made another defender miss, and sprinted ahead before finally being brought down for a gain of 22 yards. Coach said, well, if they can't stop it, let's run it again. So we ran the exact same play in the other direction and I picked up another 12 yards. Unfortunately, that drive only resulted in a field goal and our following drives didn't amount to anything either. And in the end, we lost to Notre Dame by a score of 41 to 31 for our second loss of the season. Our whole team was disappointed. And even though I had a career game with 10 catches for 105 yards, all I could think about is how we all needed to play better to give ourselves the best chance possible of competing for a national title. In the final week of the regular season, we were taking on our biggest rival, the Florida Gators. I didn't know much about them before coming to FSU, but the moment I saw their fans doing that obnoxious Gator chomp, I had never wanted to win a game so badly in my life. I was fired up and came out pancaking anyone who lined up across from me, and seeing my ferocity, Coach dialed up the same jet touch pass that had been working so well for us the week before. Sure enough, on the very first time we ran it, I took it around the edge and went untouched into the end zone to get the FSU stadium absolutely rocking. With under two minutes left in the first half, we were driving once again, and on this first and 10 play, Malik Benson caught this pass over the middle for 26 yards, but I felt a weird pop in my knee and had to come out of the game. By the time I got back in, we had a 17-10 lead, and Coach wanted 
wanted to test out my knee. He dialed up another jet touch pass, which I took around the corner before getting tackled way out of bounds on the Gator sidelines. Coach wanted to keep feeding me the ball, and early in the fourth quarter, he dialed up a smoke screen for me, which I took for a gain of 12 yards. It felt like my knee was just barely holding on and could get seriously injured at any moment, but this game was too big for me to even think about coming out again. After regulation ended in a 20-20 tie and the Gators kicked a field goal on their first possession of overtime, I knew exactly what play coach was about to call when our offense trotted out there. I went in motion, took the touch pass, cut it inside, bounced it back outside, sprinted as hard as I could, and juked out the final defender as I fell across the goal line to win the game. It was moments like these that I had always dreamed about, and as I celebrated with my teammates, it finally felt like I was beginning to live up to my potential as a true game changer. Despite having two losses, we finished the regular season ranked number three in the nation after there was an unprecedented amount of losing among all the top schools in the country. That meant if we could win the ACC championship game against North Carolina State, we would secure a first round bye in the college football playoffs. I got off to a red hot start when on the very first play of the game, I broke hard on this comeback route, hauled in the catch, and picked up extra yards after the catch for a 19 yard gain. On the very next play, Roydell Williams busted off a 22 yard gain on the ground and it seemed like our offense was going to be rolling today. But despite our explosive first two plays, we actually struggled a fair bit in the first half and were lucky to get a touchdown at the end of the second quarter to cut the NC State lead to just eight points. At halftime, I told DJ Ui Ungalale that the NC State cornerback had started getting cocky and pressing up on me on every single play with no safety help over the top. On our first drive of the second half, I blew right past the cornerback and DJ Ui Ungalale hit me in stride and then it was nothing but green grass in front of me as I took it all the way for the 68 yard touchdown. That play got our offense to snap into gear and early in the fourth quarter, I showed off my strength to hold my block for long enough that Roydale Williams was able to take it around the edge for a 24 yard run. A few plays later on first and goal, we went back to our old faithful, the jet touch pass and that nine yard touchdown seemed like it would put the game away. But after NC State managed a quick touchdown, we had to run some more time off the clock. So sure enough, coach just kept calling jet touch pass over and over again until the clock hit zero. We were officially ACC champions and had guaranteed ourselves a first round bye in the college football playoffs. Now we just had to wait and see who our first playoff opponent would be. After the game, I was honored as the ACC player of the week for my career best performance of seven catches for 141 yards and two touchdowns. And at the same time, I was giving freshmen all ACC honors for my stellar first year. But that wasn't my main focus. All I cared about is who we were playing first in the college football playoffs. It turned out that we would be playing the winner of NC State and USC. And after a hard fought game, USC emerged victorious as our first opponent. Looking at the rest of the bracket, we also saw that if we won this game, we'd be playing the winner of number one ranked Notre Dame and number 22 ranked Troy, meaning if things played out as everyone expected, we would get a chance to avenge our loss from earlier in the season. But right now, we had to focus on beating USC, and when we ran out onto the field at the Fiesta Bowl, we had nothing but all the confidence in the world. After giving up a touchdown to USC on their opening drive, we started off the game with, you guessed it, another jet touch pass. As I took the ball around the corner, I saw miles of green grass ahead of me. I juked out the safety and thought I was home free, but another defender was there to run me down. That 36-yard gain got the FSU crowd on their feet, and that drive eventually resulted in a touchdown. After USC scored another touchdown, coach went back to our favorite play, which at this point just felt like a cheat code as I picked up another 30 yards before being forced out of bounds. Jumping ahead to the second half with the score at 24 to 21 I accidentally turned the wrong way on this curl route but I was still able to haul it in and make a few defenders miss to rack up a gain of 28 yards that drive led to a field goal but it was on the next drive that I made perhaps the biggest play of my college career on third and three I bursted off the line and drifted outside to avoid the safety and DJ Ui Ungulale delivered a perfect ball and I hauled it in and galloped down the sidelines to the end zone to 
to give us a 31 to 24 lead late in the third quarter. In the fourth quarter, we opened the floodgates and coach kept me on the sidelines to make sure I didn't get injured. When the clock hit zero, we had won by a whopping score of 52 to 31. And while we were ecstatic about the win, we knew that we still had a lot of work ahead of us. As expected, in the college football semifinals, we were taking on Notre Dame in the Cotton Bowl. Having already lost to them once this year, we knew exactly what they were capable of, and this time we were ready. Or so we thought. On just the third play of the game, DJ Ui Ungalale threw the ball to me way too early, and the Notre Dame defender playing underneath picked it off and returned it for a touchdown. It was the worst start possible, but we had an entire game of football ahead of us, so we just had to stay calm and keep our composure. Composure. Wanting to turn to something reliable, coach dialed up a jet touch pass on our next drive, and after I fought off not one, but two Notre Dame defenders, it was literally nothing but green grass ahead of me, and I sprinted with all my might all the way to the end zone to get our team right back into the game. But outside of that play, we struggled throughout the entire first half. Down 21 to 10 with under 30 seconds left in the second quarter, we had a chance for a huge play down the sidelines, but DJ Uli Ungulale underthrew the ball again and the Notre Dame defender swatted it down. Things didn't get much better in the second half as our offense continued to stall out on each and every drive and then on the first play of the fourth quarter we could have had a touchdown if DJ Uli Ungulale would just lob the ball over the top but he threw it way too low and once again the pass was batted down. Down 28 to 24 with just 20 seconds left we were basically just trying to get in Hail Mary range and even though Malik Benson caught this 20 yard pass over the middle to get us to midfield, we couldn't come up with the miracle comeback. All we could do was stand and watch as Notre Dame celebrated their Cotton Bowl win as they punched their ticket to the national championship game. As disappointing as it was, we knew that we had a squad that could compete with any team in the country. It had been an incredible freshman year, and I was extremely grateful for everything I had achieved so far. Now, it was time to build on our success so that we could accomplish something truly great next season. The offseason flew by in the blink of an eye, and to start my sophomore year, we were ranked in the preseason polls as the number two team in the country. We began the year taking on a juggernaut, as in week one, we hosted the number 10 ranked Alabama Crimson Tide in an early September rainstorm. With the graduation of DJ Uli Ungalale, our new quarterback was Brock Glenn, a sophomore with a strong but erratic arm. Also, much to my dismay, our new offensive coordinator decided to remove the jet touch pass from our playbook, meaning I would have to catch passes the old-fashioned way. We came out running the ball to establish our ground game and help our young quarterback ease into his new role, but just a few plays into the drive, it appeared that coach was afraid to throw the ball at all when he called three straight runs that didn't go anywhere, including this halfback draw on third and 14 that left me wondering if we had a long season ahead of us. Those fears briefly went away though, when on our second drive of the game, I ran this deep dig route and Brock Glenn found me wide open over the middle for our team's first touchdown of the season. With a 7-3 lead in the second quarter, we seemed to be in control of the game, but that's when the wet ball slipped out of running back Jalen Lucas's hands and a Crimson Tide defender jumped on top of it to give them the ball on the edge of field goal range. Things went from bad to worse on the following drive when I misread the coverage and called for the ball only to have a linebacker sitting right in the passing lane for the easy interception. That interception completely killed Brock Glenn's confidence and the rest of the game was a complete disaster. After Alabama completely dominated us in the second half, the final result was an embarrassing 33-14 loss. It was the worst way we could possibly imagine starting off our season, but it was just week one and we knew we still had our entire season ahead of us. In desperate need of a bounce back game, in week two we hosted the Wake Forest Demon Deacons in a game that the analysts predicted would be an absolute blowout. But after our first drive ended, when I broke off my streak to get wide open and Brock Glenn just threw the ball into the dirt at my feet, we knew this win wasn't going to come easy. Brock Glenn and I weren't even on the same page on successful plays, when on this third and 15 in the second quarter, I misheard the snap count and never ran my route, but fortunately, it still resulted in a 44-yard touchdown to tight end Landon Thomas up the seam. The good news is that on our first drive coming out of halftime, we finally got on the same page when I ran this deep dig route and called for the ball because I had literally nobody near me and I kept my momentum through the catch and wasn't brought down until I had picked up 37 yards. Unfortunately, that drive didn't result in any points, and in the fourth quarter, we were just barely holding on to a 17 to 14 lead when I felt like I completely disappeared from the offense once again. Fortunately, we were able to hold on to our slim lead and we ran out the clock to escape with a 
24-21 win and avoid an 0-2 start to our season. I led the team in receiving with four catches for 79 yards, but it seemed like something needed to change for our offense to reach its full potential. After the game, I signed an NIL deal with Walker's Jiu-Jitsu, who promised me six weeks of free lessons that would help improve my quickness, which they said would make a world of difference in helping me fight off defenders trying to press me at the line of scrimmage. I decided to put in some extra practice work with Brock Glenn that week to help us get on the same page, and it felt like we made a ton of progress. He was finding me in open space and putting the ball perfectly into tight windows, and I knew that if we had this kind of connection in the actual games, we were going to be an unstoppable duo. In week three, we faced another test as we traveled on the road to take on the number two ranked Penn State Nittany Lions. As we took the field for our first drive, the home crowd was deafeningly loud, so much so that we could barely remember our assignments on each play. Just like in the previous two games, Coach seemed almost afraid to have Brock Glenn throw the ball downfield, so we ran the ball on almost every play. I did everything I could to make my blocks and try to help spring a big run, but the Penn State defenders were everywhere and we just couldn't get anything going. Jumping ahead to the third quarter, we found ourselves down 14-0 and were finally starting to put together a quality drive. On first and 10 from the 23-yard line, Brocklin was able to find a tiny window to connect with Jalen Brown on the opposite sideline for the touchdown, and that cut our deficit to just seven points. With under two minutes left in the game, we were still down by three points, and we needed a money drive to try and steal a win. But Brock Glenn just wasn't able to get anything going on the drive, and we fell to Penn State by a final score of 17-14 to to drop us to a brutal record of 1-2. and two. I finished the game with an extremely disappointing stat line of three catches for 23 yards, but while I was frustrated, all I could do was focus on the games ahead of us. In week four, we hosted the Kent State Golden Flashes, and unfortunately for them, we were playing angry. On our first drive, Coach called a speed option to my side, and not only did I take the Kent State DB completely out of the play, but I drove him backwards into the end zone and put him in the dirt. On the very next play, I torched that same DB on a crosser over the middle, and Brock Glenn hit me in stride for what resulted in a 31-yard gain that got our entire team amped up. In the second quarter, we had managed a 10-0 lead and were going in to score again, and that's when my jiu-jitsu skills paid off as I beat the press at the line, hauled in the catch on the quick slant, and extended the ball across the goal line to get us on the scoreboard once again. After we got the ball back almost immediately, Brock Glenn showed off his arm strength when he lobbed this beautiful ball to Jalen Brown on the streak, and in the blink of an eye, this game was turning into a blowout. I didn't have any more catches in the game, and Coach ended up pulling all of the starters in the fourth quarter as the game got really out of hand. Brock Glenn turned in an eye-popping stat line of 328 passing yards and five touchdowns, and the entire team started to rally around him as our quarterback of the future. That week, I received another NIL offer, this one from Eagle Eye Academics, who offered to give me free membership to their tutoring services to help me prepare for my tests, and I happily accepted because I wanted to get my GPA above a 3.5. Apparently, my academic advisor caught wind of the deal and felt a little bit left out because the very next day, I got a text from her asking if I wanted to come in and study, but I knew that Eagle Eye had me covered. The text messages kept rolling in though, as my classmate Kaylee asked me to come out to a party the night before the next game, but I wasn't going to make that mistake again and had to turn her down politely. The moment I answered that message, I got another text from Chad asking if I wanted the link to a website with old sociology papers and presentations, but I told him no thanks and that I would just use ChatGPT again. After an easy home win against Virginia Tech, we went on the road to Death Valley to take on the number 12 ranked Clemson Tigers in another primetime game on ESPN. The Tigers were hungry for revenge after we had beat them last year, but we had no interest in picking up our third loss of the season. In the first quarter, our ground game was rolling, and this jet sweep to Destin Hill reminded me how much I missed the jet touch pass from last year. In the second quarter, we were rocking a 10-7 lead when Coach got me involved in the passing game by dialing up this mid-screen, and even though it was a modest gain of just 13 yards, it felt good to stay involved. Even though I wasn't catching a ton of passes, I knew my blocking skills would always be useful, and on this third and goal play, it felt great to put the Clemson DB on his back as Jalen Lucas took it up the gut for the touchdown. But I wasn't done helping out Jalen Lucas, because late in the third quarter, after I initially ended up on the ground on this run play, I got back into the play and shoved Jalen Lucas forward as hard as I could, and before we could even process what was happening, he was sprinting down the sideline to take it all the way to the end zone for the 75-yard touchdown. I didn't catch any more passes that game, but I was satisfied that I had still made a big impact. We closed out the game to secure the 34-31 victory, and nothing felt better than hearing the silence of a stadium 
full of 81,000 disappointed Clemson fans. After some convincing home wins against Miami and Pittsburgh, all of a sudden we found ourselves ranked number one in the country despite our 6-2 and two record. We didn't think about it too much though because this week we were locked in for our trip across the country to take on the Stanford Cardinal. Brock Glenn and I got on the same page early when on the second and 19 play in the first quarter, I broke off my streak to come back to the ball and he put it right in my chest for a 16-yard gain. A few plays later, Jalen Lucas punched in the touchdown and we were off to a red hot start. Our next drive started on our own one yard line and on this run play, I almost missed my block, but my second effort was just enough to spring Jalen Lucas free for a 23 yard gain. I continued helping out our team with my blocking when under two minutes left in the first half, Landon Thomas caught this pass in the flat, shook off an arm tackle and sprinted ahead while I kept the safety occupied long enough for him to spring it for a monster gain. Still, I wanted to be more involved in the passing game and late in the third quarter, I finally got my chance. I beat my defender inside and sprinted across the middle of the field and Brock Glenn hit me perfectly in stride. I galloped down the sideline and was sure I was going to score a touchdown, but the Stanford defender just barely caught me and forced me out at the one yard line. That led to another touchdown and after an uneventful fourth quarter, we came away with an easy 30 to 13 win. I finished with five catches for 97 yards, easily my best stat line of the season, and I felt truly optimistic that this solid performance meant that I'd have a more prominent role in the offense going forward. In the following week, we were on the road against the Virginia Cavaliers, who were having a once in a century season with an 8 and 1 record while being ranked number 10 in the country. Now, I'll just say up front, there was good news and bad news coming out of this game. The good news is that we won the game easily and were once again looking like a dominant team that could compete for a national title. The bad news is that I hardly felt like a part of the team anymore. I still blocked and ran my routes and did everything I was told to, but it seemed like Brock Glenn just didn't want to throw me the ball. The only catch I had in the entire game was on this play early in the third quarter when I beat my man to the inside and cut across the middle to haul in this 24-yard reception. Besides that, I never even got another target. Obviously, I was happy that our team kept winning, but my production was heading in the wrong direction, and it's not what I was expecting after my stellar freshman year. After the game, I celebrated our 33-6 victory with my teammates, but in the back of my mind, I was beginning to question whether I wanted to play at Florida State next season. In week 11, we went on the road to Raleigh to take on the NC State Wolfpack. During the week, I had talked to both Coach and Brock Glenn about maybe getting more targets this week, and they promised that I would see the ball more. Sure enough, facing a third and 14 on our first drive, I cut inside on this dig route and just barely held onto the ball as I got blasted by three NC State players to give us the first down. We were off to a solid start with a 13-0 lead at the two-minute warning of the first half, but that's when Brock Glenn tried to force it to his favorite target, Jalen Brown, and he ended up giving it straight to an NC State defender who took it back for the easy pick six. Even though my ears were still slightly ringing from the hit that I took earlier, with a little over 40 seconds left in the first half, I went over the middle and just barely hung onto the ball once again while taking another huge hit. Brock Glenn hurried everyone to the line and sent me on a streak, and all of a sudden, I was wide open if he put it on my back shoulder, but instead, he chucked the ball as far as he possibly could, leaving me to get absolutely blocked blasted by the double coverage. I wasn't feeling too great after taking all those hits, so the next time he threw my way, I made sure to get down immediately to avoid any chance of having my head taken off. On the next drive though, I said, well, if going over the middle is the only way I'll get targets, then so be it. And on third and 10, I once again caught the pass over the middle in traffic to help us pick up another first down. In the fourth quarter though, with us losing by a score of 21 to 20, I had to come out of the game after catching this slant and getting completely lit up by the linebacker. Fortunately, our team went on to kick a game-winning field goal, and we escaped Raleigh with a 23-21 win. I finished the game with seven catches for 72 yards, but I knew I'd be spending extra time in the ice bath this week to try and recover from taking so many big hits. It seemed like the season had flown by, and all of a sudden, it was rivalry week, and once again, we hosted my least favorite team, the number 16-ranked Florida Gators. I was so hyped up to beat the Gators that on the first play of the game, I completely whiffed on my block while Roy Dell Williams rumbled up the middle for a nine-yard gain. Two plays later, though, disaster struck when Brock Glenn was late throwing to me on a hitch and the Florida defensive back jumped in front of it for the huge momentum-shifting interception. On the following drive, we had the ball deep in our own territory, and on third and seven, Brock Glenn never noticed the linebacker blitzing up the middle, and he took a safety to put us in a 9-0 hole. I wish I could say that things got better from there, but they only got worse. By the end of the first quarter, we were down 23-0, and Coach 
was still calling inside zones as if that was going to get us back in the game. Literally nothing went right. Not even when I apparently blocked too soon on this motion swing play and I was called for offensive pass interference, even though I'm pretty sure it was within five yards of the line of scrimmage. By the time we got to the end of the first half, we were down by an incomprehensible score of 33 to zero and everyone in the stadium was in complete shock. The lone bright spot for me was in the third quarter when on the second and 18 play, I was able to shake off the man coverage and break a couple tackles for a 23 yard gain. And then a few plays later, I again found open space, sprinted down the sideline and made a couple defenders miss before getting tackled for a pickup of 37 yards. But that was it. The game ended with a final score of 39 to six and what ended up being the worst loss by a number one ranked team in college football history. Somehow, some way, we had to brush this loss off because we still had the postseason ahead of us. But there was no denying that this brutal loss seemed to leave a dark cloud of doubt looming over our entire team. In the ACC championship, we had a rematch with the number 17 ranked Clemson Tigers and likely Heisman winner Cade Klubnik. This game was crucial because now that we had dropped to number seven in the country, another loss would put us at risk of missing the college football playoffs entirely. Things got off to a rough start though, and on our first drive, I couldn't hold on to this third and seven pass after I got clobbered by two Clemson defenders. We continued to fight hard, but just like all season, Brock Glenn and I just couldn't get on the same page and it seemed like no matter what route I ran, the throw was either too low or too high. In the second half, things started getting desperate when we found ourselves down 19 to seven, but Brock Glenn was able to connect with Jalen Brown down the opposite sideline for a 51 yard touchdown and that seemingly gave us a fighting chance. But just as quickly as we had gotten into the game, we fell right back out of the game as Clemson quickly scored twice to take a 35 to 14 lead. With us down by 21 points in garbage time, I at least got to show off my skills by beating the Clemson defensive back to the outside and hauling in this 25 yard catch along the sidelines. But that was only my second catch of the game, giving me an underwhelming stat line of two receptions for 45 yards. As Clemson celebrated their ACC championship win, all our team could do was stand there and wonder how our dominant season had fallen apart so fast. Now we had to wait and see what the final college football playoff rankings would be to find out if we would even have a chance to compete for a national title. When the final bracket for the college football playoffs was revealed, we collectively breathed a sigh of relief that we had been able to make it as the 10 seed despite our 9 and 4 record. We traveled up to Ann Arbor on a cold December night for our primetime game against the Michigan Wolverines who were considered the heavy favorites by the media heading into the game. On our first drive, we quickly got down inside the 5 yard line but on 3 consecutive plays, the Michigan defense held strong and after our third and goal screen pass got completely blown up, we had to settle for a field goal. Late in the first quarter, things were already getting bad when we all of a sudden found ourselves down 14 to 3. It got even worse on this third and nine play when Brock Glenn decided to just chuck the ball at me even though I was covered and the Michigan cornerback easily jumped the route and took it all the way to the house for a pick six. With under a minute left in the first half, Michigan's lead had grown to 21 points and we desperately needed to score on this drive to keep ourselves in the game. On this first and 10 play, I was at least able to help us out a little bit by finding some open space to bring in the six yard catch. But then on third and eight, Brock Glenn got sacked almost instantly and we had to settle for another field goal. By the third quarter, with the score at a whopping 38 to 13, I think coach just gave up since he kept calling run plays and RPOs even though we were down by 25 points. I still ran my routes and I still made my blocks, but everyone knew that this game was over. As I went through the motions out on the field, I reflected on how much this season had failed to live up to my expectations. I wanted to be a premier receiver in college football, and instead, I was viewed by the Florida State coaches as nothing more than a blocker and someone who could get beat up on routes over the middle. I knew now that this would be my final game in a Florida State jersey, but with the score at 51 to 23 with a minute left in the fourth quarter, I decided to show them what I could have been doing all year. I beat the cornerback off the line, hauled in the catch, and sprinted as hard as I could down the sidelines to finish my FSU career with a 75-yard touchdown. Michigan celebrated their 51-30 win, and I didn't really have much to say to my coaches or my teammates. I appreciated each and every one of them for trying their best, and I'd always be grateful for the positive memories we had together. But for me, it was time for a fresh start. Clemson ended up rolling everyone on their way to winning the national title, but as soon as the championship game was over, I put my name into the transfer portal where I knew there would be tons of schools interested in giving me a chance. The only question now was, where should I go? Do I head to Norman to join the Oklahoma Sooners where I could rack up 
up ridiculous receiving stats and pretend that defense is just a suggestion? Should I take my talents to Baton Rouge and play for LSU while learning to add unnecessary letters to half the words in my vocabulary? Or do I make my way to Eugene to play for the Oregon Ducks where I'll have a hundred different uniform combinations and look like a highlighter on national TV? These were all great choices, but after weeks of contemplation, I decided to transfer to the Michigan Wolverines. Part of my decision was based on my experience playing against Michigan and my final game with Florida State. The crowd was electric, the atmosphere was unreal, and after the game, one of the Michigan defensive backs straight up told me that if I was in their offense, I'd be one of the best receivers in the country. I guess we would find out if he was right, because I packed my bags for Ann Arbor, even though I knew that coming in, I would have to fight just to get to number three on the wide receiver depth chart. In fact, the coaches didn't waste any time at all, and as soon as we started summer practice, they put me into my first position battle. To say that I dominated the position battle would be an understatement. I felt like a whole new receiver out there. I was running faster and cutting harder than I ever had in my life. Not only did I win the wide receiver number three job, but after sitting out our first game of the regular season, the coaches decided to put me in a position battle for the number two spot. They did throw me off a little bit with a running and cutting drill I had never seen before that involved dodging big floating tennis balls as if we were in a video game. But after a few reps, I got the hang of it and passed with flying colors. I was nearly perfect in all the rest of the drills and afterwards, the coaches told me that I was now the number two receiver for the Michigan Wolverines. My first game of actually getting on the field was at home as we hosted the Oklahoma Sooners. The Michigan crowd was just as loud and full of energy as I remembered from the playoff game the year before. Before I had even played a snap on the field, I was already so incredibly proud to be wearing the maize and blue. The coaches showed instantly that they wanted to feed me the ball when on the first play of our first drive, I was able to pick up nine yards on the spot route over the middle and then a few plays later, they called my favorite play in the world a jet touch pass and I didn't let them down as I took it around the edge, followed my blockers and rumbled all the way down to the 14 yard line. That drive resulted in a touchdown but jumping ahead to the third quarter, we were down 21 to 14 and looking to score an equalizer touchdown. After I showed the Michigan fans my blocking skills by completely pancaking the Oklahoma DB on this second and eight run play, a few plays later on third and nine, I slowly jogged inside pre-snap before exploding on my route and breaking outside to get enough separation that quarterback Jaden Denigal was able to hit me right in the hands and I fell across the goal line for my first touchdown in a Michigan uniform. Jumping ahead to late in the fourth quarter, we had a 28 to 21 lead when coach dialed up another jet touch pass for me and the Oklahoma defenders were left standing completely flat footed as I turned the corner and went untouched into the end zone to put a huge exclamation point on my Michigan debut. I finished the game with nine catches for 102 yards and two touchdowns and as I celebrated our 42 to 21 victory with my teammates, I knew that Michigan was exactly where I belonged. My huge debut landed me an NIL offer with Fleming Sporting Goods who promised that their state-of-the-art fitness bikes would give me faster acceleration off the line and that was an offer I couldn't refuse. Not only that, but the coaches also decided to give me a chance in practice that week to fight for the number one spot on the wide receiver depth chart and I won that position battle with ease. The following week, we were hosting the UCLA Bruins at the big house and as the number one receiver, I now had the privilege of getting the ball on the play fake toss wide receiver screen. That's what coach called on this third and two play and I was able to follow the big boys blocking for me to pick up an easy 25 yards. In the second quarter, our backup running back Trey Kamara was absolutely lighting up the UCLA defense and on this first and 10 run, I was able to lay a late block on the safety to help him take it into the red zone for a 37 yard gain. The second half though is when I really went off and on this RPO slant, Jaden Denigal hit me in stride so I could sprint ahead for a pickup of 27 yards. I was heating up and two plays later, I came across the deep middle of the field on this post route and this time I hauled in the catch and somehow snuck in between two UCLA defenders and found myself standing in the end zone with the third touchdown of my Michigan career. But I was just getting started and with us already up 31 to 14 in the fourth quarter, I threw off the UCLA cornerback and had nothing but open space ahead of me. Jaden Denigal delivered a perfect ball and I sprinted all the way to the end zone for the 66 yard touchdown. By the time the clock had hit zero, we had come away with a dominant 45 to 14 win and I finished with one of the best stat lines of my career, racking up 10 catches for 183 yards and two touchdowns, which was good enough to earn me player of the game honors. After an uneventful win against Rutgers, we had a huge game as we traveled on the road to Eugene, Oregon to take on the number 14 ranked Oregon Ducks. Coach was 
was committed to getting me the ball as much as possible, and it showed early. On first and 10, I caught this slant against the soft coverage for a gain of nine yards, and then on the very next play, I caught this screen pass, just barely avoided the outside cornerback, and took off into the open space for a gain of 29 yards. On the next drive, apparently the Oregon cornerback was worried about another screen pass because he stayed underneath as I sprinted right past him and hauled in the catch for an easy 30-yard touchdown. With two minutes left in the first half, we had a 14-3 lead, but we wanted to score again. That's when on this first and 10 play, I found some open space on the C route and brought in the catch, and then ran through not one, but two Oregon defensive backs and sprinted as hard as I possibly could to get the ball across the goal line for the 60-yard touchdown. Not a ton happened in the second half, but we continued to pound the rock on the ground and chewed the clock out, and by the end of the fourth quarter, we had secured the 31-24 to victory. I finished with a wild stat line of six catches for 175 yards and two touchdowns, making me the player of the game for the second consecutive week. It was wild to me that in just a few weeks, I had gone from not even getting on the field to becoming one of the most exciting players to watch in the entire country. That week, I got a call about an NIL deal from my good friends at Eagle Eye Academics, who in the last year had grown to a national brand. They said their new and improved academic services would help boost my GPA by a decent amount, and I happily agreed to the deal. That week, we were on the road to take on the Minnesota Golden Gophers in the battle for the Little Brown Jug. With a 7-0 lead in the second quarter, we were pounding the rock on the ground and had crossed midfield into Minnesota territory. That's when on second and eight, Coach dialed up my favorite play, fake toss wide receiver screen, and immediately after catching the ball, I showed off my athleticism when I accelerated upfield, outran one of the Gopher defenders, and cut back behind a second one before getting tackled into the end zone for the 31-yard touchdown. We ended the first half with a 21-14 lead, but at halftime, Coach told me that he had a special play call just for me. The play was shot slot post, and with the Gopher sitting in a cover two shell, I sprinted off the line and split the safeties, and Jaden Denigal put the ball perfectly into my outstretched arms, and after running straight through the tackle attempt from the safety, I was into the end zone once again for the electric 62-yard touchdown. For the rest of the game, we just had to pound the rock with star running back Darius Taylor, and when time expired, I had another awesome stat line of five catches for 120 yards and two touchdowns to go along with our 35-14 to victory. After we easily took care of Iowa at home, we hosted the Michigan State Spartans who were doing a lot of talking pregame despite their unimpressive 4-5 and record. On the first drive, we shut them up real quick when on this run play, I destroyed the Michigan State cornerback before blocking the safety as well, and that allowed Darius Taylor to get free on the outside. After he made a Michigan State defender miss, he didn't get brought down until he had racked up a whopping 73 yards. That drive led to a touchdown, and in the second quarter, we were rocking a 13-0 lead when coach called for a speed option, and I didn't even have to block anyone because Darius Taylor was one of the fastest backs in the country, and he took it to the end zone untouched for the 24-yard touchdown. After that, I told Darius that it was my turn for a highlight reel touchdown, and on our following drive, I blew right past the cornerback, who was having a really rough day now, and I took it to the house for a 43-yard touchdown and made sure to show off my dance moves to the home crowd as well. But I had one more big play in me, and even though the game was getting out of hand, I found space on this option route up the middle, and after I hauled in the catch, cut it back, and ran through two arm tackles, I was diving across the goal line for the 53-yard touchdown. With the game getting completely out of hand, Coach rested the starters for most of the second half, and when the clock hit zero in the battle for the Paul Bunyan Trophy, we were victorious by a final score of 41-17. to After putting in excellent performances week after week, I was truly establishing myself as one of the top receivers in the country. With two weeks left in the regular season, I was third in the country in receiving yards per game and tied for fifth in the country in receiving touchdowns. I was insanely proud of my production, and I didn't have any plans of slowing down. After easily taking care of Indiana, in rivalry week, we headed to Columbus for the single most important game on the schedule as we took on the number three ranked Ohio State Buckeyes. The crowd was deafening, and the media had speculated all week that our 11-0 record was fraudulent because we hadn't faced a quality opponent yet. We didn't care though, and on our first drive, we were playing with all the confidence in the world. But on this third and eight play, even though I wasn't exactly sure what my route was, my instincts helped me find the open space, and Jaden Denigal delivered a perfect ball 
ball for us to convert the first down. Later in the drive on first and goal, Darius Taylor went untouched into the end zone to give us a 7-0 lead, and the Ohio State crowd fell dead silent. After quickly getting the ball back, we were rolling on offense once again, and on this first and 10 play from the 21-yard line, coach called for another fake toss wide receiver screen. After the big boys got out in front of me and destroyed the Buckeyes defenders, I was able to waltz into the end zone untouched to give us a two-touchdown lead. We were absolutely dominating the Buckeyes on both sides of the ball, and in the third quarter, once again, I didn't know my route because of the crowd noise, but my chemistry was so good with Jaden Denigal that we were still completely in sync, and I hauled in the 34-yard catch to get us on the edge of field goal range. With a little under four minutes left in the fourth quarter, running back Cordell Silas punched in another touchdown on fourth and goal from the one-yard line, and that officially secured the win. When the clock hit zero, the final score was 41-23, to and we waved goodbye to all of the sad Ohio State fans while we celebrated finishing the regular season with a perfect 12-0 record. I finished the season ranked number five in the nation in receiving yards per game and tied for number four in the country for receiving touchdowns, and despite not even being a starter at the beginning of the year, I finished number seven in the voting for the wide receiver of the year award. Also noteworthy that week was that I'm pretty sure my academic advisor got me confused with one of my teammates. She texted me saying I got three D's and an F on my final exams, but I thought I had done pretty well and my GPA was still a 3.6, so by my calculations, her information wasn't really adding up. That week, we had a weird situation where in the Big Ten Championship game, we were actually playing Ohio State again since they had finished number two in the Big Ten standings. This whole game was odd because while of course we wanted to win, there was also a sense that because we had finished the regular season as the only undefeated team in the country, we were basically guaranteed a first round bye in the college football playoffs regardless of the result of this game. As a result, the coaches called an extremely conservative game plan and it was clear early on that pretty much our entire team was just trying to get through this game without getting injured. Of course, I still played my hardest and on the second and 13 play in the first quarter, Jaden Denigal delivered a beautiful ball on the outside that I hauled in for a gain of 21 yards. Unfortunately though, midway through the second quarter, we found ourselves down by an alarming score of 24 to zero and the coaches decided to shut it down. Even though we were still going through the motions, at that point, they decided that it was in the best interest of our long-term goals to not give away any of our best plays. Don't get me wrong, it was extremely frustrating to hear all the trash talk from the Ohio State players, but we trusted the coach's plan. The final result was a 52 to 27 loss, and while it was tough watching Ohio State celebrate around the Big Ten Championship trophy, we knew that we were focused on even bigger goals. Unfortunately for us though, our coach's plan backfired. After seeing us get completely blown out in the Big Ten Championship game, the playoff committee had ranked us as the number five seed, meaning we had missed out on a first round bye and would have to play LSU in the opening round of the college football playoffs. That was fine though, because after an incredible week of practice, we were dialed in and ready to go as the Tigers came to Ann Arbor to duke it out for a spot in the quarterfinals. After we scored quickly on a safety and an early touchdown, on third and inches in the first quarter, I got my first catch of the game when I went over the middle on this dig route and held on through the contact to secure the first down. But after that, I didn't really have any big catches for the rest of the game. Since we were playing with a lead and Darius Taylor was running like a man possessed, the coaches decided to play it safe and keep pounding the rock. And when we did pass the ball, LSU was devoting extra attention to me in coverage, but that left way more space for my teammates to get open and make plays. In the fourth quarter, we were holding on to a 10 point lead when on this second and five play, I pancaked the LSU cornerback waited for him to get back up and blocked him again, and that created all the space in the world for Darius Taylor to take it around the edge untouched for the 26-yard game-sealing touchdown. The game ended with a final score of 37-27, to and while of course we were happy, we knew it was a long road ahead if we wanted to win a national title. The college football playoff quarterfinals were set, and we would be taking on number 6 ranked Tennessee in the Orange Bowl. When looking at the bracket, I couldn't help but notice that my old team Team, the Florida State Seminoles were on the other side of the bracket and I wondered if maybe I'd end up facing them in the national championship game. But right now, my focus was on the Orange Bowl and defeating the Tennessee Volunteers. On just the second play of the game, I made one of the best plays of my entire career when coach dialed up this end around. I took the handoff around the edge and took off into the open space, completely juked the safety out of his shoes, 
kept on chugging, ran through another tackle, and was finally forced out at the 19-yard line after I picked up an insane 67 yards on the ground. That play showed everyone that I could break the game open at any time, so Tennessee ended up double-teaming me for almost the entire rest of the game. Early in the second half, they finally gave me some space to work with, and I was able to get open on this corner route for a gain of 23 yards. On the very next play, though, I went over the middle on this post, and Jaden Denigal tried to force me the ball, which resulted resulted in a momentum shifting Tennessee interception. Tennessee was closing the gap and with two minutes left in the fourth quarter, we were barely holding on to a three point lead. We were chewing clock and forcing Tennessee to use their timeouts, but we still needed one more first down. That's when coach put the ball in my hands and as I took this screen pass, sprinted outside and cut across the first down line, I was ecstatic to know that we were one step closer to winning a national championship. The final score was 35 to 32 and everyone on our team truly believed that we had the talent to go all the way. The final four of the college football playoffs clearly showed the dominance of the Big Ten as a conference. On our side of the bracket, we would be taking on the number nine ranked Wisconsin Badgers, and the winner of our game would be taking on the winner of the Liberty Flames and none other than the Ohio State Buckeyes. The media was buzzing over the idea of a Michigan-Ohio State national championship, but we couldn't get ahead of ourselves because we still had to focus on the game in front of us. We traveled to New Orleans to take on Wisconsin Wisconsin in the Sugar Bowl, and much like in our previous game, it was clear that the Wisconsin defensive game plan was to take me out of it and force the rest of the team to make plays. That seemed to work out in our favor on this first and 10 touchdown run by Darius Taylor, but I got flagged for what I thought was an extremely weak block in the back penalty that unfortunately took our points off the board. It was a pretty quiet game for me, and even when coach tried to get me involved with a screen pass in the second half, the Wisconsin defender was there to hit me instantly before I could go anywhere. Late in the third quarter, I made my biggest contribution of the day when I caught this RPO slant for 15 yards, but I knew I had to stay focused and try to make up for my costly penalty from earlier. Holding on to just a three-point lead with under two minutes left, we needed a touchdown to lock up the victory, and that's when coach called Jet Duo. I came in motion as if I was getting a jet sweep and then did everything I could to clear out space for Darius Taylor. And just like the superstar he is, he broke not one, but two Wisconsin tackle attempts and waltzed across the goal line to put the game on ice. We won by a final score of 27 to 14, and during the presentation of our Sugar Bowl trophy, you could feel the anticipation of our entire team knowing that we were just one win away from achieving greatness. As fate would have it, in the national championship, we would be squaring up against the Ohio State Buckeyes for the third time in two months. The entire week was a media frenzy, but it went by in the blink of an eye, and as we took the field at SoFi Stadium for the title game, it's impossible to put into words how excited I was. This was everything I had ever dreamed of, and now I was 60 minutes of football away from potentially making my dreams a reality. This time, I wasn't going to let Ohio State take me out of the game, and on our very first play from scrimmage, I showed that I meant business when I got wide open on this curl route and took it for a gain of 18 yards. Two plays later, I went over the middle on this slant and picked up another 12 yards, and I already knew that I was in for a big day. A few plays later on second and goal, we handed it off to Darius Taylor to finish the drive and he squeezed through the tiny gap to trot across the goal line and make it a 7-7 game. In the second quarter, we were down by a score of 10-7 and that's when I took over. The same Ohio State cornerback from the Big Ten Championship game thought that he could press me into the dirt, but I sprinted right past him and Jaden Denigal delivered a perfect ball to hit me in stride and I took it all the way to the end zone for the massive 70-yard touchdown. But I wasn't done yet and in the third quarter, with a little under two minutes on the clock, I I took this end around and chugged as hard as I could before eventually being brought down for a 29 yard gain to get us on the edge of field goal range. That play opened the floodgates and in the final quarter and a half, we were completely unstoppable. In the fourth quarter, I was exhausted, but I was going to play my heart out to the very end. With under four minutes left on second and nine, I ran as hard as I possibly could on this post over the middle and I hauled in the perfect ball from Jaden Denigal for the touchdown. In that moment, all I could do was stand there and just be truly grateful that my biggest dreams were coming true. We immediately got the ball back and I showed off my blocking skills one final time as I cleared out space for Darius Taylor to take this run all the way down to the one yard line. We chewed out the rest of the game and as the clock hit zero, we were over the moon that we had won the national championship and done so in dominating fashion by destroying Ohio State. The final score was 52 to 20 and my stat line for the game was nine catches for 152 yards and two touchdowns, making it an incredible 
incredible performance to cap off an incredible season. We were on top of the world, and it wasn't until a few days after the game that I started thinking about my future. I loved being at Michigan, but at the same time, I had always dreamed of playing in the NFL one day. My draft stock was skyrocketing after my performance in the national championship, and it seemed like this was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. I declared for the NFL draft knowing that it was time to take the next step of my journey. But I would be forever grateful for all the incredible memories I had made during my three seasons of playing college football. Those experiences would help build the foundation for the even bigger goals that lay ahead of me as I continue on my road to glory.